right, good morning. Nice to see you all. It feels like working out all the rusty kinks of talking in person after so many years, but I'm happy to be here. If you're here to talk about how to level up your developer experience, you're in the right place. Um, I am Kristen Womack. My pronouns are she, her. I work on the Microsoft Graph API, and I lead a group of uh, product managers and content developers who are building all of the developer experiences for Microsoft Graph API. What that means is we build the SDKs, the documentation, the generators to build clients that are um, for your application, and anything else, tutorials, you name it, we build it. Um, Microsoft Graph API is a large API. So we have over 5,000 endpoints in a unified REST API, and there are over 20,000 operations. So my hope today is to bring some of our experience to you in hopes that it helps you with your application. And um, when we get to the questions in the panel, it'll be really interesting to hear a little bit more about the things that you're working on as well. So as um, has been described, this is a summit and a place for us to share experiences. So let's get into it. So why are memes so relatable to us as developers? Um, this is probably one of the most common old memes in the book, but this is newly adapted, um, generated by some artistic skills of AI and some inputs from me. But this really highlights the experience that we have as developers, where often what we're working on, it just feels like, oh, I'm almighty, I'm so powerful, I can do this, I've got this, and you're working on uh, building something amazing until you get stuck. And then it is really difficult because you can start to feel like a failure, you're like, I, this is horrible, this is miserable, I have no idea what I'm doing, confidence tanks. And this specifically is relatable to us as um, developers because programming's fun, it's fun to solve problems and write code, but it's also really humbling. And that brings us to why this meme is so relatable. It's because user experience is how a person feels about themselves when using your product. So this applies for developer experience. If you feel really good about yourself, you feel like you know exactly what you're doing, you are loving the product. When you start to feel miserable and stuck, it really comes back to how you feel about yourself. So today, I want to talk about how do we shorten that distance to oh my gosh, I cannot even get through this. This is not working till that magic moment when your code runs and it works and you know why it works. So how do we make that happen more often for developers in um, the work that we do? So I'm gonna introduce five concepts that hopefully you can apply to your developer experience that you're building. And the first one is called moments. It's all about how do we create moments for developers. There's this book I really, really love, one of the best books I read last year called The Power of Moments, and it's why certain experiences create an extraordinary impact for the users. And in the book, the authors talk about these four specific moments. So the feeling of elevation and insights, making sure that you're like, it's clicking. And most importantly for me, I think this uh, relates to developer experience is pride, that moment that you feel really proud of what you've shipped. You feel really proud that you just accomplished something. And then, of course, connection. And we feel that in our communities, in open source development, in the places that we go um, for um, help when we're searching. We can really apply this to the common concept in the API industry around getting started. So this 333 rule for APIs. Three seconds to understand. 30 seconds to discover, and when we say discover, we don't mean discover by reading the website, we mean by doing, like getting our hands on and getting an actual uh, 200 response back from the API, like, oh, I get what this API does. And then within less than three minutes, or really, if you're under 30 minutes, you're still doing really good, 30 minutes till working code, like getting through a tutorial and um, all of that stuff. But when we look at the meta journey, that 333 rule is really only for the first two steps. It's only for getting to hello world. And that's really only going to happen probably one time with your API for somebody who's new to your API. I'd like to focus on these two areas where developers are regularly shipping and building things on your platform and supporting that in production and coming back and rebuilding. So this can apply to internal developers who are building for the shared company goal of many different products. It can be public APIs or private partner APIs. Now, what I said about the first two steps really only happening once, what really happens with developers is that once they come to prefer your platform, 
they champion your platform. So by putting either products in production, by talking and being chatty with other developers and talking about the API, about um, writing blog posts about the API, about contributing to open source, and then when they want to grow, either taking their skills to the next company or they want to um, build with a new feature that you've released, they're going to come back to use. So they're not going to go through those first two steps. So what we did on our team is we sat down and we actually mapped out the journey. I'm sure a lot of you have done this for your experience, like what do they do first, second, third? What is the user experience across your developer API? And we categorized what do we want them to feel? What do we want them to think? And what do we want them to do? So then when we go through our experience, we can start to say, like, are they checking the boxes that we want them to, especially in the do? Like, are they taking action on these things? So we're going to layer on top of this the API hierarchy of needs. So again, why are memes so relatable? Why? So it is like all we talk about is API documentation, right? API documentation. Um, and when you're creating a developer experience, you want to have a list of all these things. And you can check all the list off. You can have the website. You can have the docs. You can have the SDKs. You can have everything here in this list. But it's just a grouping of things until you really create the experience around it. And what's most important is that you have your developer mid what they're doing, and you want to be able to hand them the tool right when they need it. So think about like a car mechanic or a surgeon, and they're in the middle of it, and it's like getting the tool right at the time that they need it. So how do we do that? We can make it look beautiful and pretty and navigatable and all these different things. But unless we apply this hierarchy of needs and really think about what are the first fundamental basic needs, like for example, it doesn't help if I go to trying to create delight and earn developer love with jokes and really crafty things and I spend like all my time on that, but I don't make sure that my API is reliable and that it works. So this is inspired and adapted from um, the API hierarchy of needs, which was adapted from the uh, psychological principles of like what we need to um, get to higher order things, which is like on the bottom is food, shelter, safety, etc. So then we're going to come in and add one more thing. It's called endowed progress. Um, if you've not heard of endowed progress before, there was a study in 2006 where they took two halves of the um, two groups in a study, so let's say this half and this half. And um, I can't remember what the medium was, but you know those coffee cards you can get punches on, like you get eight free, you get eight punches for a coffee, you go back and you get one for free. So they took one half and they gave them a card with eight punches and said, come back and get your free coffee once you've got these punches. The other half got a card with 10 punches, but two of them were completed. So they didn't start with an empty state of a card that doesn't have two punches. So this feeling that we have already made progress is called endowed progress. It's like motivating two humans that will keep moving forward to complete that task. So how do you create that in experiences? Um, this is a really, really subtle way to do it, that I, or an example of it, that I really love what they've done. So this is the Visual Studio um, code editor. And with any editor, you can open it and have a blank document, a blank text. Um, but they have some text in here that says, select a language, fill in a template, and, or open a different editor. And it has all these things that you can actually just take the next step more easily. Like, what's the first closest line to the next step? And the other thing that they really do that's super cool is they say, start typing to dismiss or don't show this option again. So you can actually say, don't show this option again, which brings to the point of like most products have this, um, especially at Microsoft, where you can click that box on a pop-up. So you could have used any UX treatment here to accomplish that, but they used a very developer-specific one. And you feel like very, like this is in the moment. So we want to create more developer experiences that come into the moment. Which brings me to the biggest point that we're going to talk about today, which is consistency. You must have consistency across all of your developer experiences. Otherwise, you're not handing the tool at the right time when a developer needs it. They will be leaving the experience that they're in. Maybe they're in your docs, and they'll go to the search engine. And then the search engine will come back to the docs that you're in. So like, how do we, how do we create that? So I'm going to talk about a couple of different ways for consistency. One is um, I like to call familiar hallways, like creating these hallways where you feel like you are in the same building. So for example, 
you could have many different products or many different departments in your company. I work at Microsoft. We happen to have several developer products, many of which have getting started, docs, code samples, sandbox. So putting this in a view that feels familiar to people who are working across them is very helpful to know that you're not lost, but also to make sure that each one of these products or columns, you can still have your unique flavor to what you're doing. Um, and so we'll go through a few um, examples in just a minute. So with consistency, um, there's also this opportunity to say, how do I make sure my API and my documentation are actually consistent with each other? Because you wouldn't believe it, but they're often not. So there's a really good talk that one of my colleagues, Daryl Miller, does talking about making sure that the URI paths are consistent across your documentation and your um, API. And one of the points that he makes is why would we make developers learn the same thing, a, a different thing twice for the same thing? So you want to make sure that these are really consistent and familiar. Um, this is from the Postman survey in 2022 last year, and again, lack of documentation is at the top of the list. Um, one of the things about this is that it's like this almost every developer survey that you see year after year. It's not even close to the other ones. It's really far out there. And I have come to believe that lack of documentation actually doesn't mean you don't have documentation. It means the documentation doesn't live in the context where you are. So if you make developers go back and forth to the tab where you have the documentation and they are somewhere else, like in their editor, in an IDE, it's not available. Or as Z was talking about in the last talk, where are gonna, machines need to be able to find this? So are you making sure that you're in the right spot for your documentation to be found? So with the consistency, you wanna make sure that um, in order to enable this consistency of your documentation being everywhere, it has to be human readable and it has to be machine readable. And remember that we're making it machine readable also for humans. So it's not just for machines. Machine readable is for humans also. Um, we have talked a lot about in the industry about how do we make our uh, documentation optimized for SEO. So we know that a lot of our traffic, if you're looking at analytics to your different, your website and your documentation, a lot of it is coming from search engines because as developers, that's what we do, right? We search for what we need and often that can be, we don't care if it's docs, so we, like it's just gotta solve the problem. It could be code sample, it could be on Stack Overflow, it could be on your website, but we are constantly searching for what we need next. And that's only heating up, like we need that for the LLM orchestrators and for uh, generative AI and that conversational way of finding things. If you don't have your documentation in a machine readable format, you, you can't have more than one experience. It's your docs and then you have to work really hard to make sure that they're everywhere. So, um, Z also talked a lot about standards, so like the open API specification, for example. If you are using that, that gives you another opportunity to make your documentation more discoverable and have metadata-driven experiences, which centralizes a lot of things for your, um, for your API. And then, of course, allows your API to be built into other experiences. Um, the open API specification visualization, I really like this because it kind of shows you how this can become extensible and how you can make your experience extend to other experiences um, outside of your standard where your documentation lives. Um, <clears throat> which takes me into the next point of SDKs. So with SDKs, I think that we have had a long debate for the last decade or more about like SDKs, no, not SDKs. SDKs, like love them or hate them. And I think part of that is because they do offer so much um, benefit. They offer a lot of standardization. They offer um, the ability to reduce the time and the, um, the money that you're spending on your development um, by bringing consistency. And then also <clears throat> it uh, allows for you to get started like without having to rebuild a lot of the different um, base level things. So what we found with API consumers is that API consumers are like, yeah, I don't know. I, I just don't need an SDK. I know how to make HTTP calls. I'm good. Or they'll say, you know, I just, I don't want a dependency. I don't want to depend on this third party library. Uh, no thanks. Or I didn't know you had an SDK. It wasn't even discoverable. Who knew? Um, the other thing is, oh my gosh, your package is huge. This is not going to work for me. This footprint is too large. 
And as I mentioned earlier, the Microsoft Graph API has over 5,000 endpoints and over 20,000 operations. So I'm sure that you can imagine like, how big that API surface area is when it's in a client library that you're going to build with your application. Like, yeah, mm -mm, that's OK. I'm good. <laughs> so there's all these other reasons. Like, I didn't know I needed it. It's poor quality, on and on and on. So you can see why the debate is really um, hard. It's like many benefits, also many downsides. So then there's the API producers. It's like, wow, you cannot just build one API. You can't just build an API in Go or PHP or TypeScript and just call it a day because all the other developers building in other languages can't access through the API your endpoint, your API. So ugh, that becomes expensive, right? You need an API for, uh, you need an SDK for PHP, for Python, for Go, for all these languages just to meet the community where they are, and then there's some other new popular language, and it's like you have to build another. It's never ending. And, um, and yeah, handcrafting them is expensive. Once you build it, you ship it, you have to support it. So is that where you want to spend your efforts and your time and your money is handcrafting these SDKs? Probably not. So what we um, are betting on is that like the industry is going to change in how we um, consume APIs and how we use SDKs, how we make them right size for ourselves. How do we really make sure that another way that we're bringing consistency and making sure the documentation and all the ways and the patterns that we want people to build to is right there um, for them. So we started building this tool called Kyoto, and it is a client, uh, it, it is, it builds SDKs. So it basically will generate a client library for you to use in your application, which addresses some of those problems that we talked about earlier, especially the size. So Kyoto also goes back to what I was saying about the consistency. So if you use Kyoto, this is an open source tool, by the way, um, which you can find for any API that is an open API specification. So you can actually search and say, I want to use this you can type in Stripe, you can type in Microsoft to do, you can type in anything you want, and it will help find via the open API specification that API. Then once you have that, you can actually go through selection and you can select, okay, these are the endpoints I want, these are the operations I want. And then you can generate that client library for yourself and you can use that as that's gonna be a package that's completely the right size for anything that you need, not any bigger. Um, and then going back to the idea that SDKs are expensive, um, you also can, like, this is really great because um, it's a Microsoft-funded uh, initiative. So what's really cool is, like, to go find things in the open source community as developers and highlight those opportunities so that we can all make getting to whatever we're shipping more affordable depending on um, the size of our company, the size of our team. Which brings me to the last point, and this one's a quick one. So this is strategic writing for UX. One of the absolute best books I have ever read on user experience, and this is a, like a page, you don't need to read it end to end, so if you're not a big book reader, you can use it as a reference material, but this has frameworks and how you can actually take the writing that you would put in your website or anywhere and actually extend it much further and go to like your HTTP sandbox and make sure that the consistency of your voice is coming through here or it's on your website or it's in the CLI and it's basically extending who you are um, in those ways. So these are the five concepts. Use more than one. And when you apply these, hopefully you will have developers who know exactly what they're doing, they're feeling confident, and you can mix and match how you apply this to your developer experience, but make sure that you're mapping that out and really thinking about being where developers are when they need the tool that they need to use in that moment. I'm not on any of the social medias except for LinkedIn, Strava, and Goodreads, so if you want to find me, you can start with LinkedIn. Um, and I'll leave the deck so that you have all the sources and resources. Thank you.